Good morning, good morning, good to see everybody. Wow, we have a pretty full house today. A lot of people have been sick and, you know, I get the stories all the time and COVID has been flying, Omicron is at Omicron. Uh, but we've got good reports. Everybody I know has survived and are doing good to very well. Some people are still a little tired, but praise the Lord that he has sustained us. You know, uh, we got, at, and I'll just real quick, we got, uh, Ernie's like, quick. We got uh, uh, c uh, coronavirus hit this church when we opened up back in uh, November of last year, of 2020, when we were getting ready for church. We had 50-some people get it. This is a reminder. Some of you know, you're going, yep, we were there. And we were running chicken noodle soup all over town and just, I'm going, who's going to make it? And everybody did. Praise the Lord. From our youngest to our 80-year-olds, everybody survived it. Uh, and recently it happened again and we're all here. And, and it's sad for those that don't. It's very damaging to especially older or core morbidity. But the Lord has sustained at least Evansville Bible Church and many others. The survival rate was still 99.7%. That hasn't changed. But praise the Lord, he has, and I think over the last month or two, another surge came. A lot of you have been sick again, but here you are ready to praise the Lord and trust him in our lives. So it's good to see you back. I see a full house, so I had to, had to say that. Praise him. Um, a couple of things. I need to real brief announcements. Newcomers class, again, we're starting the first Sunday of March. There are books on the back table that you can pick up. If You, you can sign up. And if, you, if you've already signed up, get a book. If you haven't signed up, sign up and get a book. There's 10 or 12 of them sitting out there. And that's a great class to begin to understand some really good principles of the Bible and what you're going to be hearing from the pulpit on a regular basis here. If you want to know us in a one-quarter period, uh, the theology around what we teach here, that is a great place where you can ask questions. So get one, one of the books if you, uh, if you want to be part of that class. Also, uh, Manny Gutierrez is going to be teaching on discipleship in the fellowship hall downstairs in a few weeks. We had a good group there today, and I pray that more would come. You want to be, when this church is open, come on in. Sunday school, uh, worship service, prayer nights, we want you to be part of all that's going on. And then beyond that, you know, you have the bulletin in your hand. You can see small groups that are happening. I, my small group... We have a new Galatians study on the back table. So if you're in my group, you might grab one of those on the way out. We'll be starting in that book in about two, three weeks. So I put them out just so you could grab them. With that, we're going to pray and we're going to get into our worship service. Lord, thank you. What a great day this is to worship you. Thank you for your sustaining power that your people, as they obeyed you and not, fors not forsaking the assembling together, Lord, you have been here to sustain us to encourage us, to grow us in your word. Lord, we just trust you. We're, we're, we're positive that you are working out all things for good, and we are going to trust you now and whatever comes forward, Lord. We don't have to be full of anxiety. We can be content in Christ and in what you are doing because you will not allow one loose molecule in the universe, and we know that, and we trust you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please stand as we're going to worship together. I just had a conversation with a person in the lobby. He asked me, how is my day? I told him, it's a great day because it's a highlight of my week when you come to church with other brothers and sisters to worship your God who saved you, who found you in this darkness. Let's sing together.
next song, it's call and response. So John is going to sing one line and we're going to answer. John is going to sing, what is our hope in life and death? And we're all going to say, Christ alone, Christ alone. Just like that.
Good morning. I really thought that uh, line that every day we have on earth is given by the king was appropriate. Um, this morning we're going to read John 11, 30 through 45. Um, it's a familiar passage to all of us, but two weeks ago, the last time we read in John um, here in our service, at the beginning of the chapter we found out that Lazarus was sick and Christ was going to go and uh, see him. They'd ask Christ to come. And Christ said in verse 4 that uh, it would not end in his death, but it was for the glory of God. But after that, he told his disciples that Lazarus had died. So now he's on his way and he's going to arrive. And today we'll see, um, we'll see what happens. We'll also see the response of the Jews who were there that they had respect for Christ as a prophet, but they still didn't truly understand who he was or, or what power he had. So let's read. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, they followed her, thinking that she was going to the tomb to cry there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her crying, and the Jews who came with her also crying, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man, who opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time he smells, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you always hear me. But because of the crowd standing around, I said this, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. And some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Right. Let us pray. Father, we just we thank you that we know you have power over life and death. You've given us our lives. You've determined our days. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to be concerned. As, as John talked about earlier, you've blessed us with health, that none of us have, have passed away from, from the illness that's been ravaging uh, places in the world in the last couple of years, but, but we don't have to fear, regardless of, regardless of how many people are are dying, regardless of what would be happening to us, and, and we don't have to worry about that because we know you are in sovereign control of everything, and we just thank you for that. We thank you for the trust and the faith we can have in you, that we don't have to worry about whether we live or whether we die. I just pray that we would focus our, our lives and our hearts on giving the glory and honor to you in every situation, and that we would work to serve your kingdom. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we continue our worship together.
Good morning. Let's pray together. Father, God, you are a great and mighty God, the God of eternity past, the God of creation, redemption, consummation, eternity future. Thank you, Father, that you have revealed yourself to us in your word, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and in your son, Jesus. And Lord, we pray that as we gather here today, we're here to feed on your word as we just sang. We're here to honor you, to grow in the things of God. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness as we confess our sins to you. Lord, we do pray this morning for our nation. We, we are grieved at how it seems Sodom and Gomorrah are esteemed in our day rather than Christianity, and we pray that you would uh, give us grace, give us mercy, have mercy on us. We pray for those in authority. Help them as they make these decisions. Help them, those who, who love you and know you to have great influence we do pray for our country. Thank you for our nation. We pray for other, wor- other countries, nations, Canada right now as they're going through this time. We pray that uh, good things will come there. We pray for Steve and Mary, for Victor and Oksana, and for other missionaries around the world. Pray for those in the Far East as well as in Africa and South America, Lord. We just pray that you would be honored, Lord, even though we know that we are headed for Uh, We're looking for the rapture and then the great tribulation coming into this world. But then when we return in Christ, we look forward to that. It's going to be exciting to reign with him for a thousand years in this world. We pray for those in authority, for for our local policemen. Thank you for them, not only here in Evansville, but in our land, Lord, as they seem to be getting a short shrift of things these days. We pray that justice, true justice, would prevail, that those who commit crimes would be would suffer the consequences of their crimes. Yeah, but thank you, Lord, now for uh, our, our church. We thank you for our families, for our young people, our teenagers, Lord. Help them. Help them to know the truth of your word and to value your truth, value that truth in their lives. And we pray for our families, our singles. So we commit our time now to you as we look into your word here in the book of James. In your name I pray, amen. You can turn to James, we're going to be in chapter 2, but James is showing us what a genuine living faith looks like in practice. Chapter 1, a living faith rejoices in trials, develops endurance through those trials, it asks God for wisdom, 
to handle the trials. It takes responsibility for personal sin. It doesn't blame God for sins. It sees God's goodness and the power of his word giving new life. True faith, living faith, grows in the word, in that same word that brought us new life, becomes a doer of the word and not just a hearer. Uh, James, if you haven't caught on yet, James beautifully turns truth into practice. James is very practical. He expects our walk to match our talk. And his whole letter attacks hypocrisy among believers. And we'll see this more and more as we go along. Uh, you can't hide from James. He's right after us, like a good dog chasing a rabbit. Now in James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, which is where we are this morning, God forbids partiality, especially to the rich at the expense of the poor. That's what verses 1 to 13 are about. Let me forewarn you that James is not woke. He is not a social justice warrior. He's not a socialist. He's not a communist. He's not a cultural Marxist calling for revolution and redistribution of wealth. He's not advocating a governmental war on poverty. The last one we had was a total disaster, and it still is. Anything that takes away incentive is a disaster. He doesn't even say that we're supposed to give money to everyone who begs on the corner. What he does say, though, is that the gospel of Christ is going to affect how we think about and look at other people and treat other people, especially the poor, of which there were many in James' day. There are many today. There are many poor that have much more than the poor had back in James' day, like smartphones and whatnot. But the Bible clearly teaches that God shows no partiality. And James is going to face us with this as a sin this morning. I think it's a fascinating portion. So he's going to give us, James is, five reasons why we are not to show partiality or favoritism to the wealthier people over poorer people. Number one, in verse one, showing favoritism is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse one, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Now you have to understand that the world James was speaking to was very divided, very divided, more than we are. There were Jews and Gentiles, slave and free, poor and rich, different nationalities, ethnic groups, and basically everybody hated everybody else. If you weren't part of the group, you hated the other people. That's just the way it was. Jews hated Gentiles, and Gentiles returned the favor. And uh, they tended to think, even in the Old Testament, that if you were wealthy, then you were really blessed by God. Remember, the disciples were amazed when Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. They said, what? Then who can be saved? They assumed that wealth was a sign of blessing from God. Now, Jesus did not come to end all of this division and, and set up a society of equality of outcome where all social differences are ended. That is not why Jesus Christ came. He came to save his people from their sins and bring peace with God. And when you're at peace with God through Jesus Christ, then you're at peace with every other person who is at peace with God. So when people got saved back in the first century, they became one with people they formerly hated. And we see this in the book of Acts, how God brings these Jews and Gentiles together. But this is why James says, 
in verse 1, if you have faith in Christ, your attitude of personal favoritism towards certain groups you're not comfortable with and against people, excuse me, your attitude of personal favoritism towards certain groups you're, you're comfortable with and against people you're not comfortable with must change. That's what James is saying in verse 1. It's a command. It says, do not, that's a command, do not hold your faith in Christ with personal favoritism. And let me just tell you that that's much, more, that's much easier to do than you might think. Even the cafeteria, when the high school goes to the cafeteria, there's a lot of personal favoritism there. There's a lot of showing of partiality there. That's the way our sinful nature goes. We like to be with people we're comfortable with. There's nothing wrong with that. But we have to be careful, and that's what James is going to talk about. He says, and he, it's not only a command, but he says, your faith is in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. He is the glorious Lord. Uh, the glory of God was in him. James may be thinking of glory in terms of the Shekinah glory, that Jesus was like the fulfillment of the Shekinah glory. But he also brings his people to glory, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. So whether you're rich or poor has nothing to do with whether you're going to be with Christ forever. He is, does not show partiality. It has nothing to do with it. Even his enemies in Matthew twenty two sixteen, 16, they said, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth. These are his enemies. And defer to no one and for you are not partial to any. And we'll see more about that with Christ coming up. So, God isn't impressed with bank accounts. He is impartial. Your human status is irrelevant to God. Al Sharpton's net worth of $5 million, or Jesse Jackson's $9 million, or Bill Gates' $132 billion, or Elon Musk's $239 billion are of no consequence to Christ. He did say it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Rick Warren, he's worth $25 million. Uh, he appeared at, in Switzerland at the World Economic Forum in Davos back in 2008. And he gave this video. He said, this is Rick Warren, author of The Purpose Driven Life and pastor of Saddleback Church. He's either retired or retiring right now. He says, I'm here at Davos with a lot of my friends. Whoa, okay. With a lot of my friends, including, by the way, Francis Collins, who is Fauci's buddy. You've seen him on the news. He says, right now, I think there are Oh, no, he, he says, uh, we're talking about what are the biggest problems on the planet and how we're going to solve them. Right now, he says, he continues, I think there are five that I call global giants. Number one, extreme poverty. Pandemic disease. Illiteracy. Corruption. Uh, he's right on that point. And the spiritual emptiness. Now, what would you say is the biggest problem on planet Earth? What did Jesus say? He said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and what? L loses his own soul. He also said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus also said, the poor you'll have with you always. So there's no program. Lyndon Johnson's poverty, war on poverty was useless. It created more problems than it solved. Once you take away incentive to work, then you've got major problems on your hands, and that's, we have that. Any program that destroys initiative and the work ethic is wrong, and that was by... Jason Ryle. I don't know if you know him. He's a black author. 
he wrote the book, Please Stop Helping Us. He's a man like Thomas Sowell. We hope they all come to Christ. But there's some, there's some black figures that you didn't hear about during Black History Month. They don't honor people like um, Thomas Sowell or Ben Carson or Clarence Thomas. No, they don't honor those people. Too bad. So Christ isn't impressed with how many zeros are behind your net worth. Christ is the radiance of God's glory, and he owns the entire universe. Why would he be impressed with a few billion dollars? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, 22 and 23, that all things belong to you. You belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. So the poorest believer is infinitely wealthier in Christ than Elon Musk or Bill Gates or Mark, what's his name? Yeah, him. Um, Zuckerberg, yeah. Every believer is heir to the universe. If you wonder how much you own, don't look at your bank account. Go outside some, even, some night on a starry night and just look up there and say, these are all mine. I am rich in Christ because the universe belongs to Christ. And he, we're going to, we own it. We own the sun. We own the moon. Number two, showing favoritism. And now James is going to run a video for us. James is so concrete, colorful. Showing favoritism to the rich. I'm going to change the title of this section, this part right here. Showing favoritism to the rich reveals evil motives. Reveals evil motives. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes and say, Oh, you sit in a good place. Sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, uh, you, you stand over there or here, sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Very interesting. James, penetrating insight here. So here comes a rich dude, glides into the church parking lot in his sleek black limo. As his chauffeur opens the door at the church entrance, Mr. Money comes strolling into the foyer handing out $100 bills to the greeters and to the ushers. They lead him into the assembly. All eyes turn to gaze upon this human phenomenon, starstruck that such a man should visit their church. The house is full. There's only one seat left. It's right up front. It's a good seat. At the same time, a scruffy-looking character rattles in on a rusty old bike, parks it beside the limo, and enters the foyer. His clothes are dirty and torn. He's missing a few teeth. His gnarly fingers are clutching a worn-out Bible. He walks in and stands beside the rich dude. He needs a seat, too. There's only one. To which man will you give the good seat? God wrote a piece of scripture just for you. What we just read. Will you show partiality to the rich? You got to think about that. Christ never kissed up to the rich. He was no fawning toady, bowing to the movers and shakers of his day. He actually condemned them. In Luke 16, it says the Pharisees were lovers of money. And Christ said, God knows your heart. What is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. In, in one sense, we could say that this poor man in 
James 2, is a picture of Christ. Hang with me now. Though he was rich, Paul said, for your sake he became what? Poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. He didn't carry suitcases around with him. He didn't have his own personal jet to fly from Nazareth to Galilee to Judea and so on. Of course, he, he did walk on the water sometimes, but... He would never appear on the, picture, on the front page of Gentleman's Quarterly. And, and just look at that ragtag team he's got with him. Bunch of smelly old fishermen with dirty fingernails. Their sleeves still have scales falling off of them, some of them. Here's the issue. Don't show favoritism and fawn all over rich people and then claim to be following Christ. That's what James is saying here. He says, you become judges with evil motives, and you have to ask yourself, now, why would I show partiality to that rich man? Why would I do that? Both of these men are image bearers. We don't know if they're saved or not. In one sense, for the story here, it doesn't matter. They're image bearers, both of them. They're eternal beings. Have you ever been in a snobbish church, by the way? You ever been in a church where the rich people get special attention? Snobbish. I detest it. If you ever sense that anybody here is snobbish, go talk to them. If he comes in the parking lot with a Lamborghini... Now, number one, when he comes in, tell him you're okay with that Lamborghini out there, but there's one condition. The pastor said he wants to take it for a ride, and he wants to drive it, okay? Next time you come, bring a Bugatti. That'll even be better, okay? You become like Washington, D.C., politicians with evil, self-serving motives, Money speaks, right? Does this happen? You better believe it. Once a church caves, and they do, actually all the time, caves to paying special attention to people who are of the upper crust. My dad described the upper crust as a few crumbs held together by a lot of dough. <laughs> I don't know if that's original with him or not. I got to Google that. But once we've shown partiality, we've grieved the spirit of Christ. In the church, in the church, the gathered church, the guy who sorts the bolts and the nuts at the Bolts and Nuts Company sits right beside and is just as important as the CEO of the Nuts and Bolts Company. They're both treated the same. They both come to God the same way through the cross of Jesus Christ. God is clear in Deuteronomy 10. Here's a couple of Old Testament references. Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God. Boy, what a statement that is. Who does not show partiality or take a bribe. Nobody's going to pay God off, right? Nobody's going to say, but God, do you know who I am? Do you know how much money I'm worth? No. And then, even clearer, Leviticus 19.15. These are just great verses from the Old Testament. And they apply today. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor. You see that? Not just don't be partial to the rich, but don't be partial to the poor. No partiality. No favoritism. That's what God says. Nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. And that's biblical justice. It's not social justice. That's biblical justice. So... 
we preach the same truth to the high and mighty and the rest of us with our feet still on the ground. I love this story. I want to tell it to you. Uh, Peter Cartwright was a frontier preacher in the 1800s. I think he was one of those early Methodists who still had the gospel. Theology may not have been exactly ours, but... But anyway, Peter Cartwright was a great preacher in the early days, 1800s, early 1800s. One day, while he was preaching, General Jackson, in 1814, we took a little trip along with Colonel Jackson. Remember that? That's what we're talking about right there. General Jackson. So while Peter Cartwright is preaching away up front, General Jackson walks in the back of the auditorium, in the back of the room, and somebody slips Peter Cartwright, a message. Andrew, General Andrew Jackson is here. And Peter Cartwright took it in stride. He said, General Jackson will be damned to hell as quickly as any other man if he does not repent. How do you like that? I think that happened. And the really neat thing, and I like General Jackson. He's got a great story, that man. But he said... A man of God ought to love everyone and fear no mortal man. Then he said he wished he had a few thousand officers like Peter Cartwright. That's in Christianity.com. We don't tailor the message, that is, to to suit the audience. So if Donald Trump walks in here, don't send any messages up here. He's going to hear the same thing everybody else hears, okay? He needs to get saved. Third, showing favoritism to the rich defies God's sovereignty, says James. Verses 5 and 7, 5 through 7. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Apparently, they're actually doing it. So this message, this letter, it's... It's getting traction there. They're actually showing favoritism. And so he says, James says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called? And we can understand that because those celebrities mock and curse Christ. So James says, listen up, church. Listen, my beloved brethren. And he shows how they've totally flip-flopped. They were falling all over themselves to impress the rich while showing no honor to that poor man. And you know that there are more poor among us. I doubt if there are any billionaires here this morning. But if you are, you too must repent or you'll perish as well. (laughs) Okay. But uh, these poor souls God sovereignly chose. Did not God choose in his election, the poor of this world, to be his people. 1 Corinthians 1 talks about this. Consider your calling, brothers. There's not many mighty in, among us. There's not many uh, great. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He's chosen the weak things of this world to shame the strong. Why? So no man may boast before God. So as long as we're in the church age, you can just forget about the church taking over the government. Okay, It's not going to happen. We are never going to be in the ascendancy and the majority in this world. Of course, we've already been told that many times. Now, and why, does that, why did Paul say that? So that no man may boast before God. We have nothing to boast about. Now, this does not mean James is not telling us that it's sinful to be wealthy. Or that somehow... The poor merit salvation. No, no. You know, there there is that liberation theology. Some of you are familiar with that name, James Cone, who talked about the black God, the devil's the white. All the white people are evil. All the black people are God's children just because they're black. How wrong that is. And the poor people aren't all God's people just because they're poor. James isn't saying that. It's not sinful to be wealthy. Everybody's saved the same way. George Whitfield preached 
to those, this is in the 1700s, a little bit earlier than Peter Cartwright. He preached, remember, to those coal miners who came up out of their holes in the ground. And as he preached to them, the forgiveness of God and the mercy of God, these coal miners, hard, you know, poor people, they, they never heard that God loved them. And the tears rolled down their cheeks and made furrows. They could, you could see the white of their skin through the blackness of the coal dust. So George Whitfield preached to the poor. But he also preached to the polished and the wealthy at a friend of his house. Her name was Countess Huntingdon's. She would invite parliamentarians and so on, the wealthy of England, to come to her house to hear George Whitfield. You think he kowtowed to the rich? I don't think so. Preached the same thing that he preached to the poor. The message never changes. But James does say that God's elect are mostly the poor of this world, but we're going to be wealthy in glory, right? The ri- what does he say? The rich in faith. Rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. So, hey, if you're rather poor, and that's all very relative, but never forget You have been chosen by God from eternity past. God chose you. God predestined you. God redeemed you. God forgave you. God accepted you. God lavished his grace upon you. He sealed you. He enlightened you. He called you. He empowered you by his spirit. Hope I didn't scare anybody, but that fly was bugging me. Take care of him later. Got him, Solomon. I got him. (laughs) You got to be quick. Made alive with Christ, made a new creation, brought near, reconciled, made one with Christ, a fellow citizen in God's kingdom, God's dwelling place. You're the temple of God. That applies to every believer. That's Ephesians 1 and 2. I just summarized that two chapters, but. Every believer, no matter what your bank account is, no matter what you're worth, that's your wealth right there. When you die, you inherit eternity. It's a glorious thing. But when you show uh, partiality or favoritism to wealthy people, not only are you dishonoring the poor man, but you're rolling out the red carpet for people, James says, who persecute you, who blaspheme the name of your Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, poor people do that too. But All right, number four. Showing favoritism sins against God's royal law. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit murder, but you do, excuse me, but if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So, James here says, he gives a great title to God's law again. He's done this several times. Here he calls God's law, and he's specifically speaking about, uh, that's Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, but it applies to the whole law, the royal law. Just think about that, the royal law. The word of God is the royal word, right? I mean, the Ten Commandments. I mean, we're, we're, we're under all of them except the Sabbath was not repeated in the New Testament apart from our rest in Christ. But it's royal. It comes from the king, the king of the universe. And a part of it is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Jesus. Somebody asked Jesus, what's the greatest law? Commandment. He said, love God with everything you've got. And the second one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The sum and essence of the Ten Commandments. Love God with all you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. That's not two laws right there, commandments. 
love your neighbor just like you love yourself. John Calvin commented on that. He said, God measured love to others with love to self because he knew how passionately we love ourselves. So, showing partiality is not just a minor fault. It's transgressing God's royal absolute law. And verse 10 says, if you only stumble in one point, if you only stumble in, if you only uh, break one of these laws, you're guilty of the whole thing. How how does that work? Because most religious people are like, man, I've kept 27 of these 50 laws. I'm good to go. No, the law is one piece because it comes from one God. So if you break this law, it's the same as breaking the whole thing. That means we all have transgressed the law of God because we've all commit murder when we hated somebody or if we show partiality. But just offending one law makes you guilty of the whole thing. So we're all transgressors. We're all worthy of judgment. We all need Christ. None of us love God and our neighbor with all we've got. Nope. We... We need a Savior to pay for our transgressions and a perfect law keeper to stand in court for us. And we stand there in Christ's perfect righteousness imputed to our account. And this takes us to the last point. Showing favoritism sins against God's mercy. Verses 12 and 13. So speak, says James, and so act your talk And your walk, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. God has freely received you through his son, Jesus Christ. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does this mean? Well, James says that God has treated us in mercy. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God has shown you mercy. God has forgiven you much. Guess what? We're to show mercy to others. If we really know Christ, if we really have had our sins forgiven, then for us to hold anything against anyone else is to deny our very profession of faith. Remember the guy in Matthew 18? He owed the Lord, I don't know how much, millions. He went in there, oh, I can't repay this, I can't repay this. Please forgive me. And the, the, the Lord says, I forgive you everything. He just received mercy, right? Then he goes out, and what does he do? He grabs somebody that owes him a few bucks, starts strangling him. That's when Jesus said, Man, that guy, is he's in trouble. If you've been forgiven, then you forgive others. Now, I do want to make a few points here. Um, All of this doesn't mean that we don't make judgments on sin. Okay? If a man is poor because he is lazy, a believer, because he is lazy, that's sin. And Paul said, if you don't work, you don't what? Eat. So James is not saying no judgment here at all. No, there there is a judgment on sin. But when it comes to Status. There's no room for favoritism. So James uses this as a mark of genuine faith. To treat others without mercy is like refusing to forgive others when you've been forgiven so much. So when Christ comes into our lives, we show mercy to others. We see all people in our lives. 
we see all people in our lives as needing Christ, and we, saw, we see all believers in our lives as those who we all stand at the foot of the cross, right? We're all equally sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, see all the people in your life through the eyes of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. So instead of showing partiality or favoritism, what should you do? Well, what should you do? How about praying for that person? I mean, some people are hard to love. There's no question about it. Some people are hard to love. Uh, you can rebuke me for this afterwards. But Jesus didn't say you have to like everybody. He said you have to love everybody. You, know, you may not want to go on vacation with this person or that person, but you love everybody. You don't show favoritism to them. Rich or poor, they all need Christ. They all need you to pray for them, to treat them well, to be a blessing to them. Okay? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. How clear it is. You've never showed favoritism to anybody. Jesus certainly didn't come showing favoritism to the movers and the shakers of this world. Lord, help us to learn from this portion. Help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. When, when there's an opportunity for us to do good to others, help us to do it. And not think about, well, is that a poor person or a rich person? Help us not to kowtow to the, to the rich, but to love our neighbor as ourself. And Lord, if there be one here, maybe they never heard a message like this from God's word. Maybe they don't even know Christ. I pray that you'll draw their hearts to you. Help them to see their own need, their own sin, that they have not loved you with all their hearts and they've not loved their neighbor as themselves. And help them to come to the cross, put their faith in Jesus. In his name I pray, amen. Please stand as we finish our service. Forgive us, Lord, that we not often bring our struggles to you. And then we don't have the strength to live our Christian life. But you encourage us always to come to you. And we come to you this morning with thanksgiving for this great reminder that you tell us to treat everybody equally. No favoritism. Yes, motivation for favoritism has evil root. Help us remember that the biggest problem that this world has is sin. And the biggest act of love to tell people the gospel, the truth. We know that gospel offends sinners. But the gospel is the only thing that can save people. Help us to love you and love our neighbors 
and be obedient to your royal law and to show mercy to people who are around us like you did to us. I ask all this in your name. Amen. You dismissed.